Ned, I've talked to brain scientists, and they show me brains. Uh, we look at the anatomy. I've talked to brain physiologists, and we talk about the, how the neurons work, and I've talked to uh, uh, cognitive psychologists and uh, um, uh, artificial intelligence experts and computer scientists, and everybody's talking about brains. You're a philosopher, so I want to ask you, as a philosopher, how do you answer the question, what do brains do? Well, there are many um, um, features of uh, the brain that are relevant to philosophical questions. One, one, I'll tell you, just give you an example of a couple of questions that I'm interested in. Uh, one is what the role of brain area has to do with the way um, activations in that area feel to the subject. That is, what kind of phenomenology comes from mm. them. Um, so um, one example of an experiment is that um, the first sensory area, sensory strip that goes right across the middle of the brain, has representations for different parts of the body. Right. The hand area up there is um, right next to the face area. Amazing phenomenon. It turns out if people have had their hands amputated, those hand inputs grow into the face area. And then if you trace out with a Q-tip on the person's cheek, he feels a thumb here, a forefinger here, a little mm -hmm. finger here. Mm -hmm. So it looks like the area actually is determining what the feeling is. But there are other cases which work the opposite way. Um, a very dramatic example is an experiment done by um, McGonker Sir at MIT, where he rewired the visual systems of the um, um, uh, infant ferret, which are born very immature, more or less the equivalent of a fetal human being. And what he did was he, he cut the connection from the eye, from one eye to um, or one side of one eye, um, to the, um, uh, the part of the visual system that doesn't go through the cortex. Um, and then he cut the input to the auditory area on the same side. And what happened is, what happens reliably, reliably, happens reliably, is that that visual input then grows into the auditory cortex. Mm. So they look to see what um, the effect of that was, and it turns out that auditory cortex starts looking much more like a visual cortex. Mm. And furthermore, the animal treats it like a visual um, um, uh, um, stimulus. So the animal, if trained to suck on one tube for a light and another for a sound, will treat that one like it's um, a light. Will we'll so treat the sound? Will treat the, we'll treat the one that's in the auditory cortex like a light. Because oh. um, it is a light. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, so, so we see the brain plasticity. We see the brain plasticity. We see that the area isn't what counts. In that case, it's how it's wired. Mm. Um, and one you know, philosophical, or partly philosophical question that I would like to know is, what determines which is important and why? Yeah, e either either the the area itself, or the way the area is or, wired, or the, or the way is wired. That's right. One, you know, yeah. if an experiment like this um, impossibly could be done on a person or something who could speak, you'd want to ask them whether those lights sounded like something. <laughs> well, there's this phenomenon of synesthesia where you get yeah. your sense senses mixed up. You see a light and you hear a sound, or you yeah. touch it and you see a color. Uh, yeah. Because there's some confusion either in the wiring or the interpretation of the wiring. Well, so it'd be very interesting to see if this worked that way, whether there was some residual um, aspect of the experience that came from the area as opposed to just the way it's wired. Yeah. And, and what are the potential implications for understanding consciousness? Well, if it, if it turns out that some aspect of the phenomenology comes from the area, then we want to know what it is about the area that makes that happen. Mm, mm. If not, then it's beginning to look more functional, and maybe the way it's something to do with the functional organization. So it's, it's relevant to the aspect of the bind-body problem that's, that asks the question, is it a matter of function, or is it a matter of the you know, underlying physical nature of the brain signals that make for the phenomenal feel? In understanding a brain, per se, what are the, the most general characteristics we can call out about, about a brain? Well. What's most important, of course, is entirely an empirical question, one that is not yet answered, namely whether it's features of the inside the 
neurons that are the mo are most important, or inter interactions between neurons, and which kind of interactions. So these are all empirical questions that um, uh, we have to look to the scientists well, to well, answer. What, what you're saying is 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 what what are the importances of the hierarchy of the brain? And yeah. we can look at, if we start with the neuron being a, a core concept, well, do things take place with inside the neuron or only on the output of the neuron? Right. Because the neuron can have uh, thousands of inputs, and it somehow generalizes this, and it has an right. output, but it can give that output to thousands and right. tens of thousands of, of other neurons. Right. Is that where things are happening? Or systems of millions of neurons working together? Right. Or the whole body? I mean, right. all these things are sort of interacting at the same time. How do you make sense of that? Well, we have to bring the right concepts to bear. You know, one concept that philosophers uh, use is the concept of supervenience. The, the idea is that... Um, uh, the question is whether it can be any different. So to say that something supervenes in the brain, like the mental supervenes in the brain, is say there can't be a mental difference without a brain difference. And so what we want to know is what's the minimal supervenience base for, say, consciousness? Um, what part of the brain is minimally required mm. to determine a conscious state? Now, some philosophers believe it isn't just in the brain, that it also is in, in, partly in the body. That you you know you can't have you can't have an experience without a body. Yeah, and, and, and others would say you need some social interaction. That there's a second yes. person part of consciousness that would be without which consciousness would be impossible. That's right. So I think those people are confusing causation with causation of conscious states with determination of conscious mm. states. So mm. the, the the difference is you know a light on the outside can cause um, um, a conscious state via acting on the brain. Mm -hmm. But I believe that the minimal supervenience base in the sense I just mentioned is the brain. It's just the brain. Mm. Because um, if you have a, because the causation can be replaced by some kind of stimulation in the brain. So the, the, the causation by the light isn't necessary. Similarly, I believe that interactions among people aren't necessary. What is really necessary is the brain itself and certain kinds of activity in it. How does the concept of supervenience uh, uh, advance our understanding of, uh, of the brain as it relates to the mind? Well, it is one form of physicalism, the, the, the view that the minimal supervenience base is the brain is a form of physicalism, uh, one that allows for different supervenience bases in different silicon creatures, for example. So it's a way of formulating a physicalistic point of view. And how does it differ from the identity solution that the brain is, the mind is the brain? It's less committal. That is, the supervenience view is less committal because it allows for the possibility that you could have different um, brains, silicon brains and carbon brains that had nothing in common that explained a phenomenal similarity. They would just be different supervenience bases the way you could have a computer made of electronics, a computer made of hydraulics, a computer made of wood. So it's giving up on a certain aspect of physicalism, the idea that every phenomenal similarity has to be explained by a physical similarity. 